Welcome everybody to the seminar of the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance. Um, it's 3 p.m. in Canberra, 9 a.m. in Europe. Uh, we have a guest speaker from Sweden today. Um, and it's the third seminar in our series on democracy and difference, where we explore um, different cultures, cultural conflicts and conflicts around culture and deliberative responses to these conflicts. Um, so for the University of Canberra, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Canberra, the Nanawal people. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. And we can all reflect wherever we are on the people and the cultures that have been um, on our land before us. So I'm going to introduce our speaker and then hand over to him. And we're delighted to, to have Eric Lundberg with us today. He's Associate Professor in Political Science and Head Representative of, Polit of Political Science at the Larna University in Sweden. He's also a researcher at Marie Sederschall University in Stockholm. I'm sure I butchered that name. Um, his research interests include the role of civil society in democracy, political participation, and interpersonal attitudes such as social, social trust and tolerance. So with, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Eric. Welcome Eric and thank you for being here. Thank you very much Hans. Um, I will share my screen and start this short introduction to this research uh, theme. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and, and uh, look forward for your comments and questions and, and uh, the following discussion. Uh, this short introduction and this research focus on the role of civil society organizations in responding to right-wing extremism. Uh, and I will share with you some of the results from a small research project that I have led during the last three years. In 2018, I was contacted by a local municipality called Ludvika in the region of Dalarna. Um, they were very worried about the political activities by the foremost neo-Nazi movement, the Nordic Resistance Movement, NRM. Um, at that time, Ludvika was the stronghold for extreme nationalistic movements in Sweden. And the NRM uh, was very active in terms of mobilizing electoral support to the local government assembly, recruit new followers, uh, and influence the public. Uh, so local stakeholders, government officials, they tried to pool resources to increase knowledge of what was actually going on and how um, one could, could respond to that movement. Uh, and they reached out to the academia too. Uh, and one theme that I found uh, particularly interesting uh, when following what was going on in Ludvika was the role of civil society organizations. So that is a little short little background of what, why, why I started to, to, to look at the civil society organizations in this regard. Um, from the perspective of, of research, uh, the focus of civil society organizations is motivated for various reasons. Uh, firstly, we have seen an increasing activity of right-wing extremism in, in many Western democracies. And it seems like uh, extreme movements, uh, neo-Nazi subcultures, along with attacks on immigrants and racist violence has become more common. Secondly, in the political science literature, the focus has mainly been on the institutional responses to of state actors and established parties uh, in response to right-wing extremism. That is, for example, the role of anti-extremist legislations and various forms of collaborations with populist parties. Of course, this is not surprising because the political parties, uh, they are uh, still the dominant players in the political arena and hold the legal authority. Uh, however, there are many other actors out there who could uh, uh, respond and act in response to right-wing extremism. Uh, and my argument here is that previous research has left relatively little room for the response of civil society organizations. Um, so the overall question in this project is how do various type of civil society organizations respond to extremism? Uh, it's quite a descriptive one, but 
it holds uh, uh, theoretical uh, perspectives too. Um, so looking at the literature, um, two arguments uh, become apparent in existing research uh, with respect to the role of civil society organizations. Uh, one, um, the more optimistic one, follows the argument made by Putnam and others, and view that civil society has a role of bulk work against ex extremism. Uh, this is suggested by, by many scholars. Uh, they have a very positive outlook on the role of civil society organizations in responding to right-wing extremism and promote democracy. They portray civil society as a watchdog against political extremism. Uh, the other um, um, argument is, is more of a pessimistic one, one could say. Um, Several scholars have pointed out that civil society organizations may also have illiberal effects. And uh, they refer to civil society, uh, parts of it at least as dark side or bad civil society and also uh, uh, the uncivil civil society. Uh, so that is also a discussion. Um, um, and, um, It was not only uh, the shortage of empirical research on the uh, civil society organizations respondents to right-wing extremists that motivated the, this research, but um, I also found that there's a shortage of typologies to study civil society organizations. So a natural starting point is of course, how, uh, uh, how, how do, do, do civil society organizations respond? Um, And um, um, so based on the empirical research and existing uh, frameworks and typologies, um, I tried to develop an, an, a new typology for classifying civil society organizations response to right-wing extremism. And um, this is presented in one of the papers that, one of the two papers that is out now uh, on this theme. Um, and uh, this is that typology. And um, here I distinguish between four types of responses that vary along two axes, tolerance and intolerance on the one hand, and passive and active political participation on the other hand. Eric, <clears throat> Eric, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. Are you moving your slides? We can only see the title oh. slide so far. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm moving the slides. Let's see here. Okay, there's a problem then. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's see. They are moving in my screen at least. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe stop sharing and share again. Yeah. Okay. So, can you see the typology right now? No, they're not moving. Maybe oh. go back to the to the not full screen view and then just click on the slide that you need. Yeah, okay. So is this better? Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, I'm sorry for the for the technical problems here. Uh, okay, I was um, into introducing this typology for classifying CSO's responses to right-wing extremism. And I, I uh, um, pointed out that there's, um, I dis dis distinguish between four types of responses that vary along two axes. It's uh, tolerance and intolerance on the one hand and passive and active uh, political participation on the other hand. Um, and the vertical axis draw attention to the de democratic paradox, how to tolerate the intolerant, uh, draw some Popper and other uh, scholars. And on the tolerant end of the axis, the dominant tendency is of course to accept, to tolerate, and perhaps also welcome uh, right-wing extremism. Um, or, or intolerance on the other hand refers to the re rejection of uh, such rights and individuals or groups of individuals within such movements, uh, since they are uh, in different ways at odds with uh, democratic liberal principles. Uh, so uh, combining these two, two uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the horizontal and the vertical axis, um, uh, I end up with four types of, of, of uh, uh, 
response system. Uh, the first one accept it combines a high degree of tolerance in combination with a lack of political action in, in relation to right wing extremism. Uh, and ban ban on, uh, on the top right here uh, uh, includes high intolerance of right wing extremists and an unwillingness to engage in in formal uh, political participation. Uh, the tendency here is to infirm measures that limit civil society and political rights of movements that do not respect liberal uh, democratic principles. And this could be, for example, due to lack of organizational resources or, or a fear to or unwillingness to to interfere with violent uh, organizations. Uh, if we look at protests, for example, it's characterized by high intolerance and high political participation. Uh, this is uh, uh, reactions that use more confrontational tactics such as protests, riots, media campaigns, civil disobedience, etc. Uh, it, its response is strong valued in the social movement literature. And finally, also dialogue. Uh, it's a high political participation in combination with a uh, more to tolerant uh, outlook towards uh, right-wing extremists. So uh, this response acknowledged the civil and political rights of extreme uh, movements, but in contrast to protest, uh, it embraced uh, responses being uh, uh, essential in the deliberative model of democracy. So uh, it emphasized uh, the importance of tolerance, inclusion, and public discussions in civil society. Uh, so, of course, this is not all the, the various types of responses you can find in civil society in relation to right-wing extremism, but in relation to previous um, typologies and, and theoretical outlooks, it uh, offers a more varied uh, way to study what is going on out there. Okay, I will uh, now to, to uh, with that introduction, we'll turn to the empirical case here and see what I found when I looked at what was going on in Ludwig. And I hope you can see the next slide here. It's on. Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you, Hans. It's a, it's a map of Sweden and, and uh, the area that is uh, marked in, in a bit more dark brown there, that's the region of Dalarna. So it's uh, quite in the middle of, of, of Sweden. Uh, and this is the evidence I draw from, and it's very uh, explorative, it must, must be said and noted when, when we like, take a look at the, at, uh, at, uh, at the data here. And, and Ludwig uh, itself is, is a small town in the region of Dalarna. It's also home for leaders of the Swedish and Nordic branch of the Nordic resistance movement. And this is actually the leading neo-Nazi movement within the Nordic countries. And Ludwig uh, was their stronghold uh, during 2018 and 2019. And for those of you who do not uh, really are familiar with Sweden, this is the place. I know you probably are, but. <laughs> um, all right, the Nordic resistance movement. Um, this is an organization that um, operates in line with uh, right-wing extremist criteria. And its overall aim is to overthrow uh, the, democ the democratic order in the Nordic region and establish a, a national uh, socialistic state. Uh, so it is strongly associated with right-wing extremism, both in terms of ideology and behavior. So, uh, and the idea here in these uh, this little research project that is actually uh, two small studies uh, has been to, to explore the responses of local civil society organizations prior and after the Swedish election 2018. There's another one uh, coming up now in September, but this was the last election. And this was a time when the uh, Nordic resistance movement campaigned for local uh, election in various uh, areas in Sweden, and in particular in Ludvika. Uh, so I used two types of material here. It's a digital survey directed to civil society uh, leaders in different types of organizations in Ludvika. Uh, and I also use uh, semi-structured interviews uh, with uh, a sample of leaders. Uh, and again, this is a very explorative approach and the result is based on a limited number of or organizations. So this must be taken into account when, when we look at the data. Um, so um, 
looking how on how this organizations responded prior to the election. And this was a very uh, intense time. Uh, there were a lot of um, uh, things going on in the in in, in the city, uh, both in terms of of, uh, of the, the activities of the Nordic resistance movement, of course, and uh, uh, local civil society organizations. Uh, so, uh, what was typical for 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 the responses uh, uh, towards the Nordic resistance movement uh, was. Uh, 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 in particular, that they acted um, to promote the importance of democracy and human rights, rather than being uh, um, out on the street protesting using civil disobedience. So uh, many organizations trying to encourage dialogue with citizens about the Nordic resistance movement, rather than being a confrontative actor towards that uh, uh, extreme right movement. Um, and also they tried to limit the visibility of the Nordic resistance movement in the public square uh, using different methods. Um, so the confrontational tactics, tactics, uh, protests, riots, and such a, um, acts that you might expect in this, um, given that this is a very uh, uh, violent movement, uh, they were less evident. Um, and the results also indicated difference between types of civil society organizations. That is differences in terms of how they responded. Um, and this uh, figure uh, demonstrate differences between types of civil society organizations uh, on the question whether the NRM should, should be banned. So this is an indication of tolerance and intolerance, uh, you could say. Um, and you can see in this slide that, uh, that political organizations uh, uh, and citizens groups, mainly here represented by associations for senior citizens, appear more intolerant. Um, so uh, um, all of these organizations would like to ban the public resistance movement. Um, and another example is, is, uh, is this result uh, showing the involvement in political activities directed at the Nordic resistance movement by type of civil society organizations. And you can see here also that political organizations and citizens group <coughs> appear a bit more active here. Um, however, uh, it was organizations uh, categorized as humanitarian and religious organizations that took the initiative to take this dialogue uh, with the public and with the Nordic resistance movement. And when talking to these leaders, uh, this became very apparent. They had different views of uh, the Nordic resistance movement uh, in terms of how to tolerant, tolerant, tolerant the, the intolerant. And this, um, these, um, oh, sorry, these uh, uh, quotes here uh, uh, demonstrate uh, uh, the differences in how they relate to this moment. Uh, while political organizations question whether the uh, Nordic resistance movement should be allowed to exist, humanitarian and religious organizations, they, they uh, claim that intolerance must be allowed and, and we must, must uh, reach out to each other with good eyes and so on. So this is a very different outlook. Uh, um, in, in, in relation to Nordic resistance movement. Um, so um, in this first study, uh, what, was, what came apparent to me was that there are differences between uh, civil society organizations in terms of how they responded. So I wanted to look at this a bit more uh, uh, in depth and further uh, explore these differences. And, so that was the, uh, the aim for the next study, uh, really. And um, I decided to, to, to also look uh, on how civil society organizations um, would respond to the Nordic resistance movements after the election, when the political climate in uh, Ludvika was a bit more uh, uh, settled and calm. calm. Um, So this was the overall research question that I addressed. How do various types of civil society organizations perceive their role, interest, and willingness in terms of responding to right-wing extremism? And of course, the theoretical and more principled 
um, interest in this is, of course, uh, whether civil society organizations could be understood as a democratic counterforce and watchdog in terms of right-wing extremism. Um, we know from the literature that the range of factors can explain how civil society organizations choose strategies and action repertoires. Um, organizational resources and inf infrastructures is of course important. And the social movement literature talked about frame processes uh, as well as the surrounding institutional and political environment. And uh, these are uh, important factors. Um, Often, uh, civil society organizations and social movements are, are portrayed as rational actors. They choose strategies in response to the resources and political opportunities uh, and constraints available to them. Uh, however, there's also another perspective um, 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 uh, described as more uh, um, using more culturally, uh, culturally attuned perspectives. Um, and uh, 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 these scholars um, argue that civil society organizations, they prefer strategies that they identify with um, and uh, strategies that follows their inner logic uh, based on their ideology and preferences of their members, for example, um, as well as extern external limits, uh, resources and institutional environments. Um, there's also um, scholars um, who claim that um, uh, that civil society organizations prefer strategies that they are consistent uh, with the values and preferences of their members, um, of course. Um, so, so this was uh, 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 an idea that was um, uh, that I based this uh, uh, research uh, from. Um, and um, in the social movement literature, and perhaps also in the civil society literature, there's a conventional view that uh, co conflict-oriented ori organizations, social movements, political organizations, are more active and use advocacy in protest uh, to a greater extent than, than more consensus-oriented organizations. This could be social service organizations, humanitarian organizations, and religious organizations. They are uh, in the literature, at least, driven less by political agenda and less political active. However, there are uh, plenty of research showing that consensus-oriented organizations, uh, exemplified by these social movements, uh, uh, social service organizations and uh, humanitarian organizations, etc., they uh, might be uh, uh, equally active in, in responding to, to political extremism. Uh, so this uh, is the indication from the literature. Uh, and to give you some example of the recent study here, um, uh, in the survey, uh, the, the uh, uh, organizations uh, responded uh, to the question whether they have an interest in responding to Nordic resistance movement. And um, as you can see, this is, again, it's very small numbers, but um, it seems like uh, at least humanitarian social service organizations, they are not less political in interested in, in responding to these movements. Uh, and surprisingly, political organizations uh, were a bit uh, less uh, interested. So that's just a small indication of, of the differences. Um, I also uh, uh, try to measure uh, the, the, the responses uh, uh, the, the, the direct responses of civil, civil society organizations to right-wing extremism in, in relation to these uh, four uh, uh, different types of, of, of uh, responses uh, explained in the typology. And um, there were actually uh, interesting uh, results. And, and, and you can see that um, uh, humanitarian and ser social service organizations they prefer dialogue uh, and protest uh, to a greater extent than, than the other types of organizations. Um, so, so this stands out a bit uh, uh, in these results. And also in line with, with the, the first study and the previous studies uh, out there. Um, well, there's some more to say about the, the figures, of course, but 
Um, if I should rush to the conclusions and perhaps also some remaining questions that it would be interesting to, to dig into. Um, uh, there's possible at least to draw three conclusions from these two small studies. Um, uh, first and related of course to the overall uh, discussion on the role of civil society organizations. Uh, it seems like uh, civil society operates as a bulk work or a counter force, um, uh, watchdog uh, against right-wing extremism, uh, both during political discharge situations uh, when the political climate is, and, and also when the political climate is less uh, troubled after the election. Uh, so there are reasons for the op optimistic account, I would say. Uh, and second, um, uh, different, um, uh, the findings suggest that uh, there are differences between um, types of, of organization in, in, in terms of how they respond to right-wing extremism. Uh, and it seems like um, that organizations that embrace a humanitarian and social role, and perhaps also religious organizations, um, um, they uh, um, uh, are um, perhaps more a bit more active, and in particular, they prefer uh, uh, responses more in line with the deliberative uh, uh, outlook. Um, and um, um, at least in compared to, to, to other organizations. Uh, and in this second study, I, I discuss whether uh, uh, whether or not bridging organizations are more likely to confront right-wing extremism in uh, a more varied way using dialogue and deliberation uh, uh, in compared to bonding organizations that would be, for example, political organizations. They organize people that are pretty much the same, uh, so to say. Um, uh, and that, that is an interesting perspective perhaps that could be, be uh, uh, developed further. Um, of course, there's plenty, of much plenty uh, of studies to to uh, uh, to to do in, in this topic. Um, one question is, is of course, um, uh, the extent to which differences between civil society organizations can be generalized uh, beyond the case of Ludwig and Sweden, uh, uh, and the way differences between types of of organizations can be further explained. Uh, comparative approaches would be very interesting, I, I think. Um, is Sweden a deviant case in this respect? Uh, in, in, uh, at least in the literature, Sweden is often portrayed as having a political culture marked by um, consensus, um, rationality, and, and deliberation. It, 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 if that is true, is this uh, why we see these type of responses, or, or could, could that be uh, explained by other? Um, um, uh, factors. Uh, of course, explanatory approaches would be interesting. Uh, digging into why civil society organizations choose different strategies. Um, my idea here was more uh, to look at to ex explain these differences uh, in, in 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 relation to more culturally culturally attuned perspectives. But that could be, uh, of course, one of many uh, explanations. Uh, and. Uh, the final um, uh, further study could be, be to, to look at the effects of different approaches. Uh, this is, of course, very difficult uh, methodologically, but could it be that uh, the deliberative approach is more efficient or effective in terms of responding to, to right-wing extremism, or um, are uh, strategies uh, uh, that um, take on a more repressive uh, uh, account uh, better in, in, in that way. So, so there, are, there are, of course, plenty of studies to do. And if you're interested, uh, this is, is the two types of two studies that is out there. Um, the first one, I think I sent to you uh, previously. Uh, and the second one um, uh, was published last week. So, so it's out there too. 
so thanks a lot for for listening in, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions, comments, and 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 uh, and the following discussion.